I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Samar's on. Hello. Hey, there we go. Hey, welcome everyone today. My name is Beth Foss and I am the Director of Operations at the Croydoremia Research Foundation. Today's webinar is going to be super interesting and exciting. We're going to be learning about a new therapy and technology about improving vision in the RP arena. Dr. Samar Mohanty is with us. We're excited about that. He's from Nanoscope Therapeutics, and he'll be joining us today and talking a little bit of, about, more about the work that they're doing in this, in this area. So before we get started, I wanted to say hello to everyone. And it's a Monday, which is not typical. Usually we do these on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so we're awfully glad you're here to join us. We want to thank our sponsor, 4DMT, for their... Uh, their sponsorship and making these happen. And today we're going to be taking questions at the end. So go ahead and use the uh, question and answer as well as the chat feature. I'll be posing those to Dr. Mohanty and we'll go ahead and get started. We're awfully glad that you're here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. And thank you, Kathy, for inviting me and this opportunity to speak to your audience and the patient groups. Welcome. So should we get started? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, myself, Samar Mohanty. I'm co-founder, president, and chief scientific officer of Nanoscope Therapeutics. Uh, today, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the optogenetics approach, which we and others are uh, advancing. Uh, but give you an update on our programs, not only on RP, but on StarGuard as well. And uh, we foresee this to be a mutation agnostic approach for multiple different uh, inherited retinal disorders as well as for advanced AMD. So I was not knowing this until very recently that IRDs are leading cause of blindness in uh, working as adults. This this genetic disorder manifests itself from early on teenagers and even earlier than that, and then progresses uh, along the patient's lifespan and uh, become very severe as they are in their very productive years. Uh, for example, here you can see the stats. Uh, this, uh, there are people who are uh, actually blind registration showed between 16 to 64, most of the people uh, are in that range and the mean age is 46 years. And out of all the IRDs, including, you know, choroidermia, uh, that RP is the leading cause of blindness in this IRD population, and around 69% patients are impacted by that. And Stargard disease is by another 12%. So combinedly, they represent 81% of the disease population. And just to pinpoint on RP itself, you are seeing on the right side a pie chart, which is showing more than there are actually, till that, more than 100 different gene mutations are associated with RP itself. And so classical gene replacement therapy to develop, you know, for individual gene mutation actually will leave a lot of patients, you know, behind. And Nanoscope is uh, trying to address democratizing this gene therapy for IRD patients and where no one is left behind. And in that regard, though the data today present uh, are on RP and Stargard and what we have, but we have preclinical data in multiple different animal models that is undisclosed. And, and we have seen that it works across the spectrum of IRDs. And here you can see a gray bar also is unknown. So there are uh, every alternate weeks or week, there are more genes are being discovered which are associated with, uh, with IRDs. So uh, I had uh, hired an employee from uh, actually, as to somebody graduated from Caltech who has gone around the world to genotype her actually uh, mutation, what caused the blindness, and she could not find it. So there are a lot of different gene mutation actually causing these diseases, which are unknown. And also there are diseases like Stargard, where there is a mutation in a very large gene, which is uh, which is causing the blindness. It's very difficult to replace. And most importantly, when the photoreceptors are lost or the RPE is dystrophic, 
where the cells are no longer present in those advanced uh, disease condition where the patients need the most, uh, whether it's light sensitivity for doing activity of daily living or whether it's uh, reading. So that's the time the classical gene therapy is not applicable uh, and where we are trying to address. So this is a little bit about nanoscope therapeutics. We are headquartered in Dallas, Texas, though we have our preclinical facility in the vicinity city of Bedford and also manufacturing and analytic facility in Arlington. We are developing gene therapy for restoring vision for IRDs as well as for advanced stage of uh, macular degeneration, which is GA. And our technology platform, we have multiple platforms for delivery, but the molecular platform that today I will be presenting is, uh, is called MCO, multi-characteristic option. What are these key characteristics? I'm going to describe a little bit, giving the brief introduction about them. I welcome any question at the end or even uh, anytime you feel, uh, please interrupt me. But the aim is to actually, as I mentioned, to broad range of these genetic disorders. Uh, but today I'm going to focus on primarily RP and Stargard uh, disease clinical data. So this is a corporate overview. We are a pivotal stage gene therapy company using MCO platform as a gene agnostic, not only gene agnostic, but a disease agnostic platform for multiple IRDs. So this sounds a broad claim, but we are the only therapeutic platform that provides actually the opsin, which is broadband light sensitivity with fast kinetics and high enough light sensitivity so that you can activate in ambient light environment without requiring any assisted device like a goggles or a stimulating device. Uh, MCO10 is our lead asset, which aim to target a large patient population, though it's a rare disease, orphan disease, but the population in US itself for RP and Stargard I mentioned is close to 100,000 or more. And we want to target the a sizable portion of this patient population. We had a positive uh, phase one to a clinical data in RP in 11 patients across the globe. If the study was done in India, which it was an open level trial, which demonstrated significant visual equity gain. The average visual equity gain was 0.3 eight log mark across the all 11 subjects. Uh, the positive, uh, the data from our phase two randomized control trial was uh, positive, it's a 12 month top line data. And also we released a six month uh, top line data from our StarGuard program while using MCO10. As I mentioned, beside MCO10, we have the next molecule is MCO20, actually suited or made to specifically for GA, uh, looking at the characteristic of GA. And also, since we are patient specific, instead of using AV vector, which is used in MCO10 program, here we are using a non-viral laser-based approach where the uh, expression can be confined to the GA or geographic atrophic area. Uh, so I'm, uh, all the work I'm going to present is possible with a uh, experienced team having expertise in gene therapy, in ophthalmology, in manufacturing, regulatory quality. So all these pieces fall together and I'm representing the company today, but the work is done mostly by the talented team that we have. Here I'm showing uh, the clinical pipeline. Uh, I already mentioned there are, uh, as I said, there are multiple preclinical assets that is not listed or not disclosed in multiple indications of IRDs. But here you are seeing uh, the MCO10 program, I already mentioned we are into a phase 2b slash 3 randomized control trial that we finished and we are looking for interaction with FDA and European agency to find an expeditious path for approval uh, to the patients with high unmet need. Uh, our, the same MCO10 uh, is being uh, tested for StarGuard patients. This is fast optogenetics program to be tested on patients with better visual equity than the profound vision loss patients that everybody is testing in RP programs across different companies. So this gave us a very good indication that there is no serious safety events or any visual confusion that may occur if you actually go through AAV and transduce bipolar cells across the retina. 
So that's a great positive outcome in terms of safety, and there are very good positive safety, uh, efficacy outcome that I'm going to present. And due to interest of time, I will not go to the non-viral program. As I mentioned, it's a laser delivered uh, MCO20 uh, program, which is a little bit differentiated uh, than MCO10 in terms of the molecular property. And IND, we are planning to be ready in uh, Q1 of next year. I don't know about all the audience. I'll slowly go through how vision is uh, um, uh, generally happens in a normal patient. As you can see, our retina is inverted. That means the photoreceptors, rods, and cones which sense light are actually all the way back in the eye. What is not shown here is a RP layer, which is also provides support for visual transduction in normal retina. So this, uh, these rods and cones uh, actually send signal to bipolar cells, and then they are processed by also horizontal and other emacrine cells, and then ultimately go to ganglion cells, which extend process their axons which bundle, which is optic nerve, takes the signal to the brain where it's interpreted and vision is uh, uh, vision function is achieved. So these uh, photoreceptor, if you see a zoomed in version on the right, uh, you can see the opsins are present in a very tightly packed structures uh, in the rods and cones, and they basically make conversion of light to electrochemical signal. And bipolar cells are basically messenger which transfer this signal and does some processing to the retinal ganglion cell, as I mentioned, and ganglion cells actually send the information to the brain and you see beautiful uh, picture as you are seeing here. Uh, but in diseases like uh, RP, uh, Stargard and other inherited retinal disorders, the photoreceptor degrades, you know, either the dysfunction or due to mutation or they degrades completely. So in those scenario, you can see a visual scene, which is on the left is a colorful flowers that we see and appreciate, but these patients actually lose their ability to see that. And in case of retinitis pigmentosa, you have a peripheral vision loss starting to complete vision loss. And in case of Stargard macular degeneration, it is uh, from the macula it initiate and then it spread all across uh, the retina. But no matter what, it leads to significant difficulty in patients' life. And uh, what we are trying to do, or other companies with optogenetics, is uh, actually to functionalize these retinal cells, which are still present or spared. And that's what you are seeing uh, here in the next slide, where we have bipolar cells that are green. And, and those are the cells we are targeting in, in nanoscope, but there are other uh, companies which are targeting ganglion cells as well. So basically we are making by uh, transducing these bipolar cells, we are making them sensitive to light and basically supplementing the need for functional photoreceptor. So bipolar cells is taking additional responsibility of transferring light into electrochemical signal. So current approaches, as I mentioned, are either targeting retinal ganglion cells or bipolar cells. So in the last decade, I was optogenetics as a field. I have been working since 2005-06 when it started its uh, uh, journey, uh, primarily neurons in 2005. But here, what I'm showing here is a slide which is showing in the last decade how these options, which are for vision restoration, primarily being used by different uh, 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 different uh, commercial entities. You are seeing here channel rhodopsin structure was discovered in 2012. The clinical trial happened in 2016 by Retrosense, now part of Allergan FV. Uh, then Crimson, so channel rhodopsin is a uh, opsin which is sensitive, is fast. It has millisecond kinetics, but it has low sensitivity only to blue light. So my early research in blue light uh, uh, has shown that that by very prolonged exposure to a low sensitive opsin for long duration can cause, uh, uh, cause uh, compromise the viability of retinal cells. And that's where we started to deviate from that and uh, wanted to develop a more sensitive opsin. So in the field, if you see um, uh, in the next, uh, uh, in 2014, there was discovery of crimson and pronos or uh, by mutating different uh, naturally occurring 
of sins. So crimson is sensitive to red light and chronos is sensitive to, again, blue light. And they're being used with two different companies uh, 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 here listed. Gensite is using Crimson R and uh, Bionic Site is using Kronos. Uh, they are fast, but uh, again, these two options are not as sensitive uh, to light or they're sensitive particularly to red or blue color light. In 2015, uh, there is a option called Octo M Glue R6 is, is developed. It's only responsive to blue light and it's very slow. And uh, it's being uh, uh, now acquired by Novartis. The company Arctos Medical is acquired by Novartis and being uh, in preclinic as a preclinical asset is being developed. MCO was uh, made uh, in 2016. It has high sensitivity across colors and it's uh, fast. Is broadband. I'll show you maybe some data. And uh, then in 2019, and clinical trial actually started in 2019 in India, as I mentioned, and then 2021 in the United States for RP program, and then again 2022 for Stargard program. Uh, then mid wavelength cone of scene, uh, as well as COCHR3M, are being pursued by Vedera, which is acquired by Novartis, and Ray Therapeutics. Respectively, these two options have high sensitivity, but only to green or blue light. Uh, MW option is sensitive to green light, and the other one is sensitive to the blue light. But both of these options are slow, as you can see in the graph here. It's showing the off time of response uh, uh, is uh, 15 seconds for mid wavelength option, uh, cone option, and uh, uh, around 1000 milliseconds for for the other options, COCHR3M. So the references are here. I will be happy to take more questions on that. But before going into our clinical data, I wanted to show what happens with patients with low vision. So to us, you know, when we when it becomes dark, like sunset, we can see objects in a dimmer light environment. But these patients, because they're losing their photoreceptors or because of dysfunction, also then the sight uh, becomes the night, like when it's evening time, it feels like night, complete dark night. And then slowly, slowly as the disease progresses, then even daytimes looks like evening. And then the whole time period becomes complete dark for this patient's life. So the sensitivity of the option is very important. We just took a video in the next slide I'm showing here, if you take, a normal vision patients and you are going to a bathroom, you, you can see the door, you can see the door knob and go. But if the sensitivity of option is, uh, this is exactly a 70% if sensitivity instead of 100% normal vision, you see, you can still see the doors and knob and things like that. But if it becomes low sensitive, uh, let's say log fold or even half a log fold, then you will see that you are unable to see the doors or windows. So this is a very common uh, thing that happened for RP patients. So this is what uh, a sensitivity or option to ambient light is that's why very important unless you are using an amplifying device. The second part I'm showing here the, about the broadband sensitivity. Let's say you are at a cross section in a normal vision patients, you can see the blue sky that you are seeing. You have a red light, you have a yellow light or a green light when you want to cross a uh, cross the road, if you have an option which is only sensitive to red light, then only you can see when the red light glows. The other light, even if they glow green or yellow, you cannot see those light. And same thing is true for a blue light sensitive option. But nanoscopes option can see, uh, allows you to see this all different color environment that uh, or all different colors that you are seeing. You may not be able to see the true color, but patients are reporting color vision. They can see things in different colors. But here what is showing is the importance of a broadband option to, to envision objects. This is another example in a video. Uh, you can see it's a normal vision patient in somebody's home, has a, a bar, small bar. You are seeing that when the patient's vision is impaired, now it slowly it becomes dark as you are seeing here. But if you just take the red channel of this image, you will see nothing on the left side or blue channel on the right side. But when you have a broadband option, you will be able to see objects, whether the environment is blue, green, or red. So 
it basically that's what uh, this is basically happens when you have a, a broadband option. These images or videos are created just by switching off different colors of uh, uh, of the chip in your uh, camera. Another important aspect I mentioned is the fastness of uh, your option. If your kinetics of your option is very slow, then you will start to see blurring of objects, like a moving car must have moved, but still you will be seeing light and the blur will be seen. So, so it's very important to have an option which is not only sensitive to oh, low level of light, but also to, uh, also to at a fast speed. Lastly, it is very important to uh, understand that we are targeting bipolar cells, which is 10 times more in human retina. There are 100 million photoreceptors, but 10 million bipolar cells and 1 million ganglion cells. So we just simply took an image, and if you have 100 to 10, there's a 10 times reduction that we are getting. So we are not expecting a 20 by 20 vision, but if you take the 10 times and then actually show, that what is the square root of 10, then you just pixelate that image to three times uh, in each direction, then you see a pixelated image. It's not that simple, the vision, but I'm trying to make it to a level where you know everybody can understand. But in bipolar cells, being 10 million will pixelate the image to a level that you are seeing on here in a, a call out box here, yellow box, where you will see the images in, in, in certain resolution. But if you do again, the same process of three times reducing the resolution in either direction, you see a very pixelated image in ganglion cell. Our preclinical data using our opsin head on comparison have shown that, that the visual equity, which we tested by optometer, optomotor response, is actually proving that the visual equity is dependent on which type of cells we are targeting. So this is basically the same thing is showing in a video. You, uh, this is a normal vision. And then when you target ganglion cell, the images will be pixelated as compared to uh, the uh, bipolar cells. Now coming to uh, the, the our product MCO, what you are seeing here, is a, a this is a AV package proprietary AV packaged uh, vector. You can uh, see uh, uh, there is a MGLU R6 promoter enhancer which actually target uh, specifically on bipolar cells, uh, and the transgene is shown here, which is packaged in a single AV vector. Uh, and then once on bipolar cells are transduced with this AV vector, they express the MCO they depolarize uh, upon ambient light, broadband light stimulation. So with the injection, uh, intravitreal injection, which can be done in a doctor's office within a minute time, the cells expressing bipolar cells and once light falls on them, the vision can be restored or improved as compared to severe vision loss patients, as you are seeing on the right. Uh, there is a, Actually, there is a video here, which basically describes that process. And since we are targeting post-mitotic cells uh, and non-dividing cells, and it's a membrane protein, not like a secreting protein, so we believe that the expression will last for significant duration of uh, after injection, and the the functional vision restoration should be preserved for the rest of the life of the uh, patient. So here you are seeing bipolar cells getting transduced and the once uh, light falls on them, they depolarize and send signal to the brain. And since most of these patients have optic nerve also intact, those signal goes to the brain and uh, the vision is uh, restored. Here you are seeing how I made a statement that is target the bipolar cells specifically. You can see on the left hand side is an untreated or a control retina. The, this is a, a green is a marker for bipolar cells. You can see the expression 
on the cell body, body as well as in the axon going up to the terminals into ganglion cell. But the ganglion cells, you cannot see the soma of ganglion cells being uh, there, um, uh, uh, being stained because it's a specific marker. And the middle panel is for red, which is for MCO, and it has a reporter M cherry. You see, there is no uh, no marker, uh, no expression in these cells. But on the right hand side, on contrary, you will see very robust expression with intravitreal injection uh, into the soma as well as into the axon and the terminals. So this uh, this expression is actually a, we quantified it uh, with single intravitreal injection, more than seventy percent expression in the bipolar cells. And this expression lasts for very long time in the patient, in the in the animal models. And also this was found to be dose dependent, as you are seeing on the right. So higher quantity of vector being injected, the expression levels were higher and uh, faster also the expression was. And this 70% or high transduction was seen not only in this blind mice model, but also in dogs and other animal models in monkey as well. So the expression was uh, more than 70% across species, which was very robust with intravitreal injection. And that was possible with our proprietary AV vector that we utilize. Here you are seeing uh, a mice, uh, retinal degenerated mice, which uh, at, uh, this, these videos are taken with infrared camera. You can see the mice is struggling to find the lighted platform. Uh, and uh, after injection, though, you can see now the mice interacts with the cone of light and find the light without making any error. So, and this response, as I mentioned, is not only true for this is a RD10 mice, but we have done it in multiple different animal models, uh, including Stargard animal model, LCA, and other animal models. So, where we find that this therapeutic efficacy is uh, exhibited. And this uh, this efficacy is also dose dependent, the behavioral efficacy. We also have data on electrophysiology and other measures. Optomotor response, as I mentioned. To summarize, MCO expression is specific to on bipolar cells. It is dose dependent and is sensitive to visible light spectrum with fast kinetics because the we actually did optomotor response with very high speed rotation of those uh, black and white stripes, and we can see the high speed, uh, the, the mice can respond to those high speed movement of the uh, of the bars, black and white bars. And the MCO injected mice not only show improvement in the water mesh behavior that I showed video, but also in the optomotor response. Now moving on to uh, directly, I will not go through the phase one data. Uh, I think I had presented to Corridormia Foundation a couple of years or back. So I will directly jump into our phase to be restore data. Uh, so restore is a randomized multicenter uh, SAM controlled clinical trial uh, to treat advanced RP patients. Uh, and these advanced RP patients have, we defined them by visual acuity level having 20 by 1600 or worse, which is 1.9 logmar in the study eye. Um, and the other eye was 20 by 800 or worse. Uh, we evaluated two dose levels, nine subjects per dose level, and another nine subjects in SAM arm. So total 27 subjects. The primary endpoint was changed from baseline in a mobility test, um, and the secondary endpoint was SEP discrimination test, which we designed in, in consultation with regulatory agency. And also visual equity was another secondary endpoint. And of course, ocular and systemic safety was another endpoint. So here in this slide, you are seeing the study design, restore study design, uh, where uh, these three dose are marked here was 1.2 E11 genome copies per eye for the high dose group, 0.9 uh, E11 GC per eye for the low dose, which these two doses, as you can see, are very close to each other. They were primarily put to increase the robustness of the trial and the masking. So in our pre-specified you know, SAP, we have uh, combined the two doses together because uh, they are so close, there are only 25% difference in that dose level. And we had a SAM control group. The patients were under uh, from minus three to day 17 for three weeks, patients were uh, under a uh, 
tapered oral steroid prophylaxis regimen. Uh, uh, the key endpoint or primary endpoint was at 52 weeks, uh, uh, where the sponsors, the patients, the outcome assessors, clinicians were masked, except the injecting physician, which is different from the physician which actually monitored them. And, but uh, we actually masked the study for another year uh, without any regulatory requirement, but to see the consistency of efficacy. So we already presented top line data for our 52 weeks, which is primary endpoint, but we'll have in Q1 of next year, uh, the two year data that we are looking forward to observe our uh, consistency in efficacy. The key inclusion criteria I already mentioned, 20 by 1600 in injected eye or worse than that, and fellow eye should not be better than 20 by 800. Exclusion criteria was uh, primarily the, the patients who cannot actually pass, uh, who cannot, who pass actually the mobility study in, in very low light level so that they have room to improve. So the mobility assay was developed and have been recently validated uh, in this patient population uh, is basically getting the idea from how the pre-existing approval on Luxterna where two light level improvement is considered clinically meaningful. But the mobility assay was made simpler because these patients who are so profoundly blind, they do not have even confidence to do the mobility test without uh, having a, you know, a cane, or a guide dog or somebody holding their hand, they're, they're fearful of moving without the supporting uh, uh, support. So we actually appropriately made the essay uh, appropriate for this patient population, where there are obstacle, you are saying three obstacle on the left, three on the right, simulating a doorway, and then uh, having placing a central obstacle in the middle so that they have to avoid that actually and go to one of the randomly lighted panels that you are seeing. So there are multiple um, uh, factors who are taken into account so that the patient do not just perform the test by memorizing which path to go. The light was randomized. The patient is required to pass three out of three trial consecutively without making error. So the probability gets multiplied means by chance you cannot pass three out of three. Uh, we have seen that in a very high uh, efficacy level. So uh, there are five light levels you can see here. Sorry, six light levels. They are separated by semi-log. So the patients are scored if they pass the lowest light level is the highest score of five. And then if they cannot pass the brightest light, which is 100 logs, then patients were scored minus one. And uh, so in our study, we found 67% of the patients, 12 out of 18 actually improved by two light level as compared to uh, three out of nine or 33% SAM subjects. Uh, so you can see one patient here performing. Dash zero zero right eye. So you can see here patient performing uh, the tests. What I'm showing here is a trial one. So you can see, uh, The patient is even struggling. Uh, it's a little bit very dim light room. Uh, you can see patient is not even able to, he's hitting the center obstacle, not even able to find a lighted panel. These images have been amplified in intensity, but you can see if the patient cannot find within 60 seconds, it's a very simple maze, then was positioned, and still the patient is hitting the center obstacle. And uh, now at last uh, finding the light, I think. Uh, but like this, multiple trials are done and to find that if they can perform this task easily, it's basically emulating the condition like to going to a lighted doorway or to an exit sign or to a lighted window and see if this simple task like this, if patient can perform. Here you can see randomly the other side of the light is now switched on and the patient is still struggling. This is before uh, before actually dosing the patient. So at, at, at 52 weeks after treatment, the patients, as I showed, some of them actually improved uh, 12 out of 18. 
The other test is multiluminance self discrimination test. So this doesn't involve any grader. The other one is graded by two masked grader and then uh, scored uh, for consistency or interrater reliability and stuff like that. But here you are seeing it's an automated machine to actually detect objects of different yeah. shapes. And there's a voice, uh, the proctor put different shapes into different locations. They are under a piezo sensor and the subject is asked to pick up the object. And, and and then you can see here, this actually emulate the condition where you are going to pick up an object from your refrigerator, whether it's a food item or, a, or some item under a lamp or things like that. So here also there are five different, you can see score from zero to five um, uh, uh, at different light intensity, which are semi-log difference. In this test, uh, 10 out of 18 subjects improved by two or more light level as compared to two out of nine SAM subjects. But most importantly, uh, what we saw, which is a re replica of our phase one to a study, is an improvement in BCVA in these patients. Uh, so here you are seeing uh, on the left side, MCO treated patients is a waterfall plot. Some of the patients actually improved uh, more than uh, you know one log mark, which is 10 line gain in visual acuity, uh, but some of them improved little less. But seven out of 18 improved by 0.3 log mark or more, uh, while only one subject, which is a protocol deviation subject, improved 0.8 log mark uh, in here, as you are seeing. So if you remove this one person for protocol analysis, and also removed another person for another reason here on the MCO subject, we have a statistical significance of 0 0.02 uh, here you are seeing. So this is very similar to what we saw in our phase one to a trial. But most importantly, what we discovered by doing all these different trials, that these patients is represent a very heterogeneous patient population. One single endpoint is not sufficient to measure the improvement. Uh, the, the data that I presented when I said 12 out of 18 subject in improved in mobility, ideally those are 12 out of 13 because five of the subjects did not have much room to improve in, in their mobility essay. Same thing uh, in, the, in case of uh, BCVA, most of the subjects actually started below the floor of the essay, means the, sub, the patient's vision must have been much worse than what we can measure. So each individual essay has a limitation. And because of multiple different genotype in this patient population, what we are observing, some patients have their macula so severely impacted that that central vision may not be improved improved by an optogenetic approach. So the peripheral vision improvement is also significant in patients' life because they can have a good mobility and do activity of daily living better. And the patients who are able to do those activity of daily living with intact peripheral vision, if they improved in BCVA, then our central vision to recognize object, that's we believe is a significant improvement uh, in their uh, life, quality of life. So we had predefined, pre-specified composite endpoint where either improvement in mobility or object recognition by two or more light level. There we see 16 out of 18 subjects actually improve as compared to four out of nine uh, SAM subjects. And it's a statistical significant improvement, 0 0.02. We also uh, did post-hoc analysis. This is done across all the patients in the, uh, ITT population, no patient is uh, uh, discarded. Uh, the post-specific analysis also showed there is compelling evidence of uh, statistically significant benefit in the treated group. Whether you take mobility with BCVA or mobility with SAP or BCVA, and uh, I think we have a, a justification here for this heterogeneous patient population that this composite endpoint actually bring meaningful assessment for patients uh, to evaluate the patient's improvement. So with this, we are uh, actually interacting with regulators uh, in US as well as in Europe, and to see if there is a path forward to take these endpoints, composite endpoints forward. Uh, here, what you are seeing is uh, a little bit, uh, when people ask that you have uh, multiple assessment, how do they do in, uh, in multiple assessments? So if you see here, 
the circles in the middle, uh, which is intersection, there is a Venn diagram, which is saying which are the patients who improved in BCVA, the patients who improved in mobility or in self discrimination. You see in the intersection of these circles, there are 10 out of 18 patients who actually improved in multiple assessments. So not just in one assessment, but multiple assessment as compared to only one out of nine uh, patients in the same group. So that's a statistical significance again. So that can be also uh, showing that the compelling benefit in these patients that they're observing in not just one endpoint that I talked about, but in two different endpoints together. Uh, as I mentioned, secondary endpoint was safety. You can see here uh, at 52 weeks, uh, we see mild to moderate ocular age across uh, different dose groups. Uh, there was no significant dose dependence in safety either. Like the same thing is true for efficacy because the two dose were so similar. But you can see surprisingly, there were subjects, uh, these patients having in the same group also have anterior chamber cells or inflammation. There was only one SAEs observed that's in the same group, not in the MCO treated group. It's a non-ocular SAE that occurred. Uh, you can see here a uh, very favorable safety profile that we see in the MCO dose group. Here we are showing the intraocular inflammation. You can see there are transient inflammation increase in some of the patient. This is a dose dependent. You can see there is no dose dependence, but uh, except one patient who had multiple times the recurrence uh, most of the patients were, um, you know, treated with uh, topical steroid. Uh, only one patient had chronic adverse event, and uh, it, it was uh, it was controlled by topical and oral steroid. Uh, no patients uh, require any. There was no uh, uh, vasculitis, choroiditis, retinitis, hypopion, or hypotony in any of the patients and uh, any intraocular pressure increase were treated uh, by topical drops, not requiring any surgery or sequel. Uh, so the safety profile really uh, shows compelling benefit or, or very high safety and the benefit is compelling as summarized here. There is approximately 90% or 16 out, out of 18% improved by two or more uh, light level in mobility or self discrimination. The mean change in BCVA was 0.3 per log mark, uh, which is in the ITT population with a statistical significance of P equal to 0 0.07. But the statistical significance became more when uh, in the PAR protocol population, when one subject from each group was excluded based on major protocol deviation. There were comparable incidence of treatment emergent adverse event across study arms. So with this compelling benefit and safety, we think this product profile is favorable uh, and uh, for patients. So there is some patient story, one patient story here I have for one minute I would like to play. The day I went into the surgical suite, they had me to lay down on a, on a table, put some numbing drops in my eye, just, just like dropping eye drops in your eye. That's what it felt like. It was no discomfort. And then he says, okay, you're done. Well, prior to that treatment, I couldn't see that light right there. I couldn't see that light right there. And I can see a, a little bit of your shadow. Say. It was like you looking through a pipe. No, no side vision, no nothing. That you know, I enjoy fishing. I enjoy riding four wheelers. I enjoy swimming. I have me and my grandchildren, which they have to help me some. But we have just started back fishing. See, even when my wife, when me and my wife is, is making the drive down here, I can see calls coming up, coming. I can see headlights coming. This is just the beginning of what's to come. Today. So there are different patients actually report a different outcome. I think our time, I would rather take more questions, but I will show you one slide on our Stargard disease on, uh, on 24 weeks data. Uh, we had only six patients having ABCA4 mutation, three was having uh, uh, macular degeneration phenotype, and three had a, a different uh, pan-retinal dystrophy. 
here the primary endpoint was safety and the patients were not only on oral steroid but had a topical steroid regimen uh, as i mentioned this target patient had better visual equity they were in the range of 1.32 actually 1.9 log mar uh, again safety there was no serious adverse event there's dollar well tolerated no endophthalmitis retinitis or choroiditis and intraocular inflammation was no greater than two plus Here, what you are seeing is uh, here. What you are seeing is the BCV improvement. Actually, two out of three patients improved by more than ten letters. This is this BCV is evaluated by ETDRS, and you can see uh, patients improving there. And with a wearable magnifier, which just uh, zoom in function, there was a change in BCV. Uh, you can see here all three out of three macular degeneration phenotype actually improved more than twenty letters. Uh, this one zooms in into areas you know where there is maybe transduction and improving the visual equity so this is compared with respect to baseline also using the wearable magnifier uh, there's no light intensification or stimulation but it's just uh, like a available off the shelf magnifier which is available that using the patients really improved in their visual equity so with that, I'll play again. This is the, I think, last slide. I for received a, treatment seven percent. months ago. So each visit, there would be an improvement, especially on the eye chart. The greenery, everything looks more greener than what I've seen before. When I would grab my phone and then aim for my magnifier, I was already seeing that it's like the time 12, 20. Watching TV, you know, I know who the characters are by their voice, but, you know, now... Like I watch and I can see their face structure. It's like, uh, and any little bit of vision, I mean, is better than, you know, what I had before. I. So with that, I wanted to summarize that uh, we believe we have a fully genotype agnostic approach, not just for one IRD, but for multiple IRDs. Yeah, it can be addressed. MCO is a fast and natural light, ambient light activable option and without requiring any intense external stimulation device. Uh, this broadband, which is patients have reported different color improvement and as well, uh, but under different color environment, it activates the cells and give vision without being restricted by the color environment. Targeting bipolar cells, we believe as our preclinical data shows and clinical visual equity efficacy we have seen across program that is owing to the bipolar cell targeting. And we are gearing towards uh, a laser based delivery to targeted atrophic area to, uh, to minimize any exposure to AV vector for a large mass market or to, uh, and also allow us actually, this will allow us to redose the patients as the GA grows uh, because there is no immunogenicity or restriction to redose the patients when you use a non-viral vector. So definitely we have interest in uh, addressing choroidermia using this platform technology. We look forward to any grant or philanthropic support to advance our uh, you know, uh, non-clinical studies. We are uh, open to collaborations, any support in our investment, fundraise, strategic partnership, and also uh, assessing the patient database for our future programs. So we have multiple uh, clinical and scientific presentations which are coming up, which are listed here. Uh, as you can see, will be in Uretina, we have multiple presentation there uh, coming up by different KOLs, including myself, our CEO, our CMO, recent CMO, Dr. Samuel Barron, he is presenting in gene therapy for ophthalmic disorder in Boston. So I look forward to interacting with you all. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our information is on our website and everything. So with that, I would like to thank you and take any questions if you may have. Well, we have them coming in. That was great. It was extremely exciting. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation.
I have some uh, questions that have come in over my cell phone and some that are being listed here, folks. So go ahead and we'll take a few minutes. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Mohanty. That was really um, encouraging. So here, let me just get ahead, go ahead and get started, if I may. Um, it's uh, going into phase three clinical styles. If this gets approved for RP, could it be used for CHM or other IRD off labels? As a company, I will not be able to, you know, support any off-level use, but it's up to the clinicians and uh, there are multiple opportunity off-level use, but I cannot ascertain to that. And it's not in our for viewer to comment on this uh, meeting, but definitely we are looking for once it is available in, uh, you know, real world, then I think there can be compassionate use can be made. There, there can be other expanded access program that we can initiate. I think that would be a better opportunity as a company that what we can do, but it's up to the clinicians to take individual decision and, and use, but we will not be promoting those. But, but if, if, if in future in, in the, what are in, in our clinical development, we would like to address patient population, which are not more severe, which are less severe. That's why our attempt was in Stargard. So if there is a possibility to do a trial where there is a basket trial where multiple indications are grouped together to expand the level, that will be as a company, we'll, we'll make effort towards that uh, to make it really officially available to all other patients' population. Uh, what IRD patients would not be good candidates for this? Yeah, we have uh, as, as, uh, we have patients with cone rod dystrophy, with Stargard, with uh, uh, Osser syndrome. Of course, they're part of RP, but there are multiple different other mutations which may be implicated in other IRDs. Where in our study population in phase one, two, there is a dozen of mutations, and in phase two B, there are two dozen mutations. So we have a vast amount of mutation which may be uh, implicated in other IRDs. But just to tell as a scientific basis what is not if you need to have your inl uh, inner nuclear layer or bipolar cell layer intact uh, or or like live so we have not excluded any patient based on that you know so inl layer can vary from thickness we had patients varying from very thin inl to very thick inl but all the patients had some amount of inner retina so if that ird uh, has inl or bipolar cells present so we can target them or our drug will be able to target uh, but if due to certain mutation uh, there is uh, optic nerve atrophy for example your optic nerve is damaged due to certain mm -hmm. disease for op1 or some other mutation then that may not be that there will be very rare i think patient uh, will be like that and the second one is we may not be knowing some mutation which may say that bipolar cells are present, but they're not functioning at all. Like in the sense, they cannot be depolarized. So that is another uh, another point. Lastly, uh, like we had patient from 15, uh, 18 or 20 years of age, 18 years in phase one, two, but in this phase two, we restored trial, we had patient from 20 years to 83 years old. So the patient who is in 83 year old or 80 plus year, and disease has manifested from 10 in teenage, so they have been exposed to 70 years. Still, they have bipolar cell intact and we could show improvement in those patients. Uh, but there is there may be condition where the cells are completely disorganized and not connected to ganglion cells and then may create uh, not that level of improvement. So the improvement will basically vary on the severity of disease at what stage they are there. Um, and, but we have not seen a very clear picture of that uh, coming out from these small trials that we have run. So most of the patients improved in one or the other criteria. Another question that came in was on the, the dosing. How often would you need to have, what's the protocol standard for the dosing? Yeah, it's a single uh, intravitreal injection as others may be a little fast. We are targeting post mitotic cell means the cells are no longer dividing. That means the cells once express the protein is supposed to, and it's an epigenomal expression. So the the gene transgene is inside the cell. So it, if there is a depletion of any protein on the membrane, then it will produce more. 
but unlike antiphage or any other complement factor gene therapy where you have to keep on producing the protein which has to be secreted and secreted and perform the function here it's it's like on the membrane so it's not a secreting protein and it's a mature cell so we don't foresee from our preclinical study or the mechanism of action to be injecting more than once so it should be once in a lifetime injection and uh, but it's yet to be seen we are now doing our uh, we have completed three or four year of our trial in phase one two we are following up those patients so we have not seen any safety signal on those patients yet so it's safe definitely but efficacy wise we have to yet see long term how it pan out that's exciting to watch <laughs> The, uh, another question came in, of course, we always ask, what is the what is the cost to this kind of a procedure? Yeah, that's an important, important one. And uh, I think with, uh, with scale and as we can address more with the same drug, more and more IRD patients, I think the, that will also dictate the cost. We, we are yet to do the cost effectiveness analysis to actually uh, say something about it. But definitely we can understand that there is a patient unmet need and the patients really at this uh, working age population need this uh, uh, drug more than patients who, you know, this is their most productive time. So I think quality adjusted life years will be impacted by our drug in a positive direction. So we'll be cost effective, that much I can say. Okay. What level of vision restoration could patients expect in a best case scenario? Can you, like telling the difference between an apple and an orange, be able to read any kind of large print? What is the expectation with the RP patients? Yeah, so we, we do not want to set very high expectation, but just to answer this question, we have seen in our phase one to a, there are a couple of patients actually out of, uh, we had eight high dose patients out of which at least two or three could read big font letters. Uh, like uh, they were completely blind. Like I mentioned, they are 20 by 2000 or worse and they could see big letter fonts. And of course, apple and orange discrimination is, uh, is similar to our test in MLSDT. We showed 10 out of 18 percent improved in those kind of measures. And then uh, theoretically, there is a possibility to achieve 20 by 50 or 20 by 60 vision from uh, by targeting the bipolar cells effectively by 70%, 80% if you transduce your bipolar cells. And then with the size of the bipolar cells and resolution, we anticipate 20 by 60 vision. And if you see in the graph I present, so around three or four patients in, out of those eight patients in phase one, where they improve to 20 by 200 or better vision, which is logmar one or, or, or better. In our current study, in restore study also, there is patients who improved around 1.8 logmar. So that means from 2.2 logmar, they improved up to 0.4 logmar, which will be the limit, like I mentioned, 20 by 40 or 20 by 50 level. There are other patients who also improved to similar levels. So I think that's, but we don't want to set a very high expectation uh, to the regulatory bodies or to the patients. Then sometimes, you know, uh, and as I said, that is very multifactorial. If everything is intact, retina health is good, we transduce enough with the highest dose or the optimal dose, then those kind of efficacy may be achieved, uh, uh, but uh, everybody may not be improving uh, to that level. All right, we have some questions I'm gonna ask now from our chat feature. It says, thanks for the great work for IRDs like choroideremia. If the R... RGCs in in there were supporting rods and night vision. Are there any indications that they are hardwired into the brain, to the brain, to processing signals for night vision? And inversely, RGC in the fovea wired for color and acuity. If not, are you relying on neuroplasticity to adapt? <laughs> And would older patients have low, low, excuse me, would older patients have lower neuroplasticity to adapt? Yeah, this is all, uh, there are very good question. If you understand, if I understand correctly, the question is uh, that uh, what is the role of neuroplasticity or learning? Definitely, this is a newly engineered retina. 
uh, and we are seeing patients telling about seeing colors as i mentioned as you see we have a broadband off scene so the way the cells will be depolarized uh, the efficacy is different for blue to green to red so mm -hmm. the brain or eye can learn to to those colors and that's why maybe they are differentiating we we do not have like three different options into three different cones here but we definitely think learning at retinal and cortical level will be important neuroplasticity will be important older patients whether they will see better all these things is yet to be seen uh, but definitely uh, there is a some level of learning at both retinal and cortical level uh, but i think we, we, we are hearing better than what theory or what we understand as scientists so far that how they can perceive color how they can do so we are hearing much more better outcome than theoretically we can predict actually all this uh, uh, from, from the older patient as well as younger patients here's another question what opportunities does mco 010 have in choroideremia yeah i think this is very pertinent to your foundation and as i mentioned as a we as a company would like to have it available to as many IRD as possible, but our first go-to market is RP. But once uh, that's there, we would, we would have a development plan which uh, can include this. But uh, at present, I can say that as a mechanism of action, it has a great opportunity for choroidermia. So whether uh, the company or the investors will support the development in choroidermia and how regulators give us uh, assistance in expanding our level for choroidermia it will all depend on the clinicians the patient advocacy groups and everybody we working hand in hand with them we would definitely love to have this available to choroidermia patient we can provide preclinical data everything but clinical trial require investment and regulatory support so we need to have the patient advocacy group work hand in hand with us in near future so that we can expand the level in is available to RP as well as other IRDs. When is your phase three expecting to end? Sorry, they're coming in. Yeah, so the our current uh, restore trial that I showed was a randomized control trial. Uh, it was a phase 2B trial. So it has shown very, uh, uh, as I mentioned, improvement in BCV and mobility and self discrimination. Our goal would be to push the regulator for a uh, path to expeditiously make it available to patients while we are doing a confirmatory or a phase three trial, another trial if it's required. So those are under all under discussion. But at present, what I can see is our phase to be restored trial. One year was supposed to be trial duration. We extended for one year, but for regulatory purpose, we are submitting all the data for that one year, which is our primary endpoint. The second year is just for the perspective from a company perspective we want to see whether a masked manner we can still see the efficacy on the following years and the trial will continue through long-term follow-up you know this any gene therapy trial continues to be followed up for five years at least so our phase one to a trial is continuing with a long-term follow-up same thing for starlight trial and the rp trial they will continue we'll because we want to see not only efficacy, but the safety of patients is very important to us. We want to see long-term there is no, no safety issues in these patients. Okay. Um, a final question, unless some other people type in, is would early stage patients qualify for this therapy or only late stage with low or no light perception? And how would you mark that if you were to consider um, earlier stage patients? Yeah, so, so that's exactly how we proceeded. We we started in our phase one to with try to enroll some no light perception patients, but as literature have shown, because of RP or different IRDs, uh, generally RP and Stargard, the patients do not become NLP because of RP. They become NLP. There can be some other reasons by which they become NLP. For example, you may have a optic nerve atrophy, glaucoma, and other things. So where we do not see any RP patient in our trials who is NLP. So most of them were LP, hand motion, or count finger, or mostly maybe bare light perception. So to answer question, that 
for RP or Stargard, we have not any exposure to NLP patients. So it is working in patients which are, as I mentioned, their better vision was 20 by 800 or worse. That's how we define the severe vision loss patients. Their worst seeing eye is 20 by 1600 or worse. The better seeing is eye is 20 by 800. So in a database, if somebody is 20 by 800 or worse, they become severe to us. And that's our patient population we have experience in RP. Then if you go to star guard, that is where we have patients which are 20 by 400 and worse, and they improved as well as they showed some data. So that's the moderate vision loss patient. Next, we are going to 20 by 400. Then, uh, so we believe theoretical limit is 20 by 60 so we, or 20 by 50. So we think legally blind patients, 20 by 200 or worse, may maybe benefit because 20 by 400 already we are seeing benefit. So we think it's very close to the legally blind 20 by 200 patient. Then that being said, our drug when targeted to bipolar cell, we have seen some disease modifying aspects, for example, not just light sensitivity, but actually maintaining uh, the bipolar cell layer better than not actually injecting the patient. So, uh, so maybe even earlier stage patients can benefit, but we do not have clinical data. We have some preclinical data, but not clinical. So I cannot comment on that, but definitely legally blind and above patients are the ideal target for this therapy. All that's super duper exciting. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh that's all the questions we have. This has been amazing. Thank you everyone for your time and uh, thank you so very much. Thank you for joining us and we really look forward to uh future updates. Thank you to Kathy uh for arranging this and uh we just look forward to seeing what happens in the near future. We will be keeping tabs on you for sure. <laughs> thank you. Beth Thank you, everybody, for joining again. We'll be having some more of these future of choroideremia and researches to come. So again, have a great week. Take care. And thanks again. Thank Bye. You.